Good morning. My name is Brad Colburn, and I'm a recent new member here, a couple months. Uh, I'm a member of the men's ministry, uh, the facilities group, and a life group. And I'm going to be reading this morning th- uh, Revelation 1 through 10, 19, 1 through 10. Um, After this, I heard what seemed to be a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Alleluia! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. For for once more they cried out, Alleluia! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated at the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, Alleluia, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It is granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold the, to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Thanks, Brent. Well, last week, uh, Brody was up here, and he was talking about this, this special giving project that we have called Heart of Advent. And the idea is that it's so easy to get caught up in the more of Christmas, to buy more, the, the, the commercialism, the consumerism that can come at this time. And we want to remember that we've already been given the most generous gift that there is. And that's Jesus coming to save us, to rescue us from our sins. And so it's a time that we want to be intentional about how do we use our money? There's more information about Heart of Advent out in the lobby. I think you were given a, a postcard about one of the, the options that's there. But, but I want to start just a little bit with, as much as it's easy, to get caught up in the spending that happens all around this time. It's easy to get caught up in all of the things that go on around Christmas. Like there's office parties that happen. There's, there's meet up with family and friends. There's, there's uh, special activities that are done just at this time of year. There's this more and more and more, and it starts to explode all over our calendars. And the worry that, that I have in this time is as, as our calendars become so full that we miss the specialness of this time of year, that we miss the fact that we have all been brought together with nothing else in common other than Jesus to celebrate that he has brought us together. This is such a special time for us as a church family. And so it's why we, we offer some of the things that we do. We intentionally don't overschedule this time with events or activities, but we are intentional with what we schedule. And I know this sounds counterintuitive. You just said not to fill our calendars up, and now you want to fill our calendars up. But we want to, to schedule things that help us to focus on what is so special about Christmas. We have an event next Sunday that we have pitched it as this is just a time of rest for you. We'll have food available. We'll have activities for kids. We'll we'll have singing and carols and this time to rejoice as people who have been made new because of Jesus. Carols and campfires next Sunday. I encourage you to attend one of our Christmas Eve services. I know that Christmas Eve is a time that's, that's full of family plans and the like, and those are good things. But it's a time for us as a church family to gather as well. It's not just a a service that's tacked on at the end. 
This is the, excel- the celebration that we have, that we've been building towards throughout the year. We have three services. I'm sure, sure something in there fits within your schedule with, with other things that you have going on, 10, 30, 1, and 3. Really encourage you to be part of that. And then finally, Dakota's put together these Advent uh, 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 Advent materials for families. This intentional pause to reflect on what is so special about this Jesus, uh, this season. What is so special about Jesus coming? It's a time that's so uh, celebrated at churches. This time of year is is such a significant one at churches. It, It even has a name that it's been called throughout generations of church history. It's a time called Advent. And Advent just means coming. It's it's where we intentionally reflect on the fact that Jesus has come, how earth-shattering that is as we wait, as we are eager to see the day that he comes back. Now, there's been some questions about, well, how are we going to be in Revelation through uh, the end of this year? How are we spending Christmas in the book of Revelation? And, And there's a part of me that thinks that this is the perfect book for this time of year. We talk about how uh, Advent is a time of particularly focusing on Jesus, and and Revelation chapter 19 is perhaps the greatest picture of Jesus that we have in the entire Bible. We we talk about how this is a time where we are waiting, and Revelation 19 tells us exactly what it is that we're waiting for. It's also starting a new section, that we're wrapping up a section that we've been in in the book of Revelation since October 8th. Revelation chapters 6 through 18 are all focused on God's judgment, the the necessity of it, and the reality that it is coming. While it hasn't made for the most fun reading every single week, it's been so encouraging to see all throughout that God is making all things right. He is bringing people close to himself. He is patient. He's allowing time for people to repent. That he is restoring all of creation. That he not only has the right to judge, but God is only right when he does judge. And now we get to this section that's so full of praise and beauty and joy. And yet we don't rush into it. We don't just skip ahead to Revelation 19. Because without those chapters that come before, without these pictures of judgments, we don't get to the praise and beauty and joy. Or another way to put that, without chapter 6 through 18, there are no hallelujahs in chapter 19. You probably heard that word quite a few times as Brad was reading it for us. And and hallelujah is a word that the people know, they can at least recognize it. Even people who aren't around the church or who've never been one, they know, oh, hallelujah, that's a churchy word. And, And the word just translates quite simply to praise God. Hallelujah, praise God. And as much as Christians use this word, and we have every right to use this word, our language should reflect praising God. But as much as Christians use this word, it's interesting that the word hallelujah hallelujah only shows up in the New Testament four times, all four of which are in Revelation chapter 19. Revelation 19 is a chapter of hallelujah, of praising God. And I think when we look at these four different uses, uh, all of them give different reasons to praise God, as well as summarizing the rest of the chapter. So I want to structure our time around these four hallelujahs. Look at the first one that's given to us. Uh, Revelation chapter uh, 19, verse 1. It says, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Uh, Another way that we could put this would be, praise God for he is the sole authority. No one else is like him. No one else can rival him. He alone is worthy of all this praise. God is the sole authority. This is coming after chapters of beasts and dragons and women who are also cities and and all of these things that are set up against God. And yet we are told God alone has salvation and power and glory. Especially in the last two chapters that we're in, 17 and 18, we're given this city that's set up to go against God, and yet we see nothing can act as a rival against him. Nothing can stand against him. Nothing or no one can oppose this God. 
It reminds us of our lives that we all feel this pull towards other things to find value and identity and significance and purpose and hope, and yet all of them crumble in light of who God is. Babylon fails. It, it, I really like how one of the commentators I read put it. He says, Babylon worshiped gods that could not save and killed those who did not go along with her idolatry, but salvation belongs to God. Babylon proudly took glory for herself, but glory belongs to God alone. Babylon exercised stolen power in God's world, but power belongs to him alone. Babylon's lies will be exposed. And truth will ring loudly through eternal celebrations of God's salvation and glory and power. Now that is something worth celebrating over. That is worthy of hallelujah. Because think of the comfort that that provides to us. I mean, how much in our lives do we ask the questions of, does God really care? Is he able to help does he know what's going on? Does he, does he actually have an interest in what's happening here? Is God uh, able to do what it is that he says he's going to do? Is he going to keep his promises or is he just far off? I mean, as we read through the descriptions of what God's people are going through in the book of Revelation, those questions start to come. Is God actually going to work? I mean, just living in our lives, And the time of waiting that we are in, waiting for Jesus to return, those questions come up all the time. And yet the ringing truth, the words that are given to us here is salvation and glory and power belong to God alone. Think of the comfort that that provides. We see the heavens erupt in song after all that God has done. Hallelujah for salvation and glory and power belong to God. No one else, no one can rival him. God alone is able. God alone will. God alone can. The second hallelujah that we see comes from verse two. It says, hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The, the her here is Babylon, that it's been destroyed. So another way that we could put this is praise God because he is judge and there is finality in his judgment. That he is bringing an end to all evil. That he is, uh, he is bringing destruction to all who seek to destroy And this, I I think, really captures what the rest of Revelation 19 is is focused on, that we have this picture of judgment that comes as this vision is given to John, this vision that we are so eagerly waiting for in this Advent season, let alone all of our life, as he sees this vision of Jesus returning. This is Revelation 19, verse 11. It says, Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and sitting on it, uh, sitting on it is called faithful, uh, the one sitting on it is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. So hallelujah, because John has this incredible vision. It starts this, this, uh, this series of three different things that John sees, and the first thing he sees is heaven open, and this one riding on this horse. He gets this vision of Jesus in all of his glory, Jesus who has come, Jesus who's come to make war. And it's in bringing this judgment that he is bringing salvation and rescue and redemption for his people. And we get this whole series of incredible descriptions about what Jesus is like. We're told first that he is on this white horse, which was a war horse that at the time uh, conquering kings would ride in, in a white horse to show that they have won. We're told that uh, his name is faithful and true. No other person, no other ruler can make this claim pointing to the fact that Jesus alone is right to rule. It says that he judges and makes war in righteousness. So there's no question about his decisions or his motives. They are perfect in every way. It says that his eyes are like fire, pointing to the fact that he is perfectly pure, that he is a name that no one knows, that he is divine, that there are parts of him that we do not know still, that we can spend an eternity learning more and more about Jesus and never exhaust the subject. 
It says that his, he's wearing a robe that's dipped in blood, which could either point to the fact that this is his own blood, since there, there's not a battle yet, and if he's covered in blood, it, it must be his own, which points back to the fact that victory came all the way back on the cross, that him dying was the source of his victory. The, the other option is that he's, he's uh, has wearing clothes dipped in blood because the assurance of victory is there that it's as if he's wearing the markers of success before even the fighting begins. He says that he's called the word of God, showing that he's the revelation of God, that he needs no one, and yet he's surrounded by this army of his faithful followers, that he has a sword that comes from his mouth. He has no need to swing a sword at all. He has no need to fight because just by his word alone, he is victorious. He says that he will rule with with an iron rod, which we tend to think of dictators in that way. And yet it's pointing back to the Old Testament. It's the fulfillment of the promised kingdom that here is this king who is greater even than David. Said all the more clearly with the last thing that's said of him, that he is called the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. I mean, think of the comfort that this provides for us. How easy is it at times to think that other things are ruling, to to believe that that something else has taken over the throne of this world, that we look around and we just see wickedness or evil or abuse or immorality or idolatry or death or destruction or apathy or conflict. And yet we are told of this Jesus, this this one wearing many diadems, Crowns are this this picture of rule and authority all throughout the book of Revelation. And yet every single one of those crowns that's mentioned, they're all numbered. There's 10 or seven or something like that. But Jesus has many. He is uncountable. His authority is limitless. He alone is called the King of Kings. He alone is called the Lord of Lords. It is a picture of Jesus that captures what, what Abraham Kuyper, he was a Dutch theologian who actually rose to become prime minister in Holland. He says uh, this, he says, there is not a square inch in our whole of creation over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. There's not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. That is the Jesus that we are waiting for. This Jesus who is coming to bring judgment, to make all things right, to bring a restoration to people and all of creation. This Jesus who's so majestic, so glorious, that the only response to seeing him is to say, hallelujah. And yet it's fascinating. Once again, we are not told of any fighting. Yeah, there's armies amassed. Jesus is coming with with this army, but there's no actual fighting that's going on. That Jesus is victorious just by who he is. By his very nature, he wins. Imagine uh, sitting down to to play a board game with someone and and you finally get all the pieces set up. In some board games, this is a a, a task in and of itself to get everything set up. It's so intricate. And you finally get all ready, you're ready to play, and your opponent sits down next to you. And before you do anything to play the game, they say, I win. That is how Jesus deals with evil. From the very beginning, just by who he is, by his nature, he is victorious over all that is wrong. He is successful over all that looks to bring defeat. This is the Jesus that we are waiting for. One so worthy of hallelujah. Praise God. We're told that John has three things that he sees. First, it's this vision of the heavens open and this incredible picture of Jesus. But then he sees these birds that are summoned in in verse uh, 17, I think it is. These birds are summoned to come and and eat of, of those who are opposed to God. So again, it's not a fun thing to be reading, but it points to the fact that there is no status, no, no, uh, nothing that a human holds on to that saves apart from one's association to Jesus. This is rich and poor, slave and free, all face the same end if they are not counted as with Jesus. The, all those who are not at the feast, the marriage supper of the lamb, well, they will be feasted on. 
And then the third thing that John sees in verse 19 is, is the, uh, the capturing of the false prophet and the beast. That this is Jesus bringing an end, not just to those who oppose God, but to those who try to encourage others to join in their evil. And it, not just the, what is wrong in the world, but all that seeks to spread despair throughout this world. Jesus puts an end to that with his coming, with his return. It makes me go back to that first, that ultimate hallelujah in verse one. Hallelujah for salvation and glory and power belong to our God. And here we see this so clearly that, G, that God brings this salvation with this return, with Jesus coming back, he rescues his people. Salvation is being rescued by God's power for his glory. Then we have this third hallelujah, which is uh, quite simply put as amen, hallelujah. Uh, and that's in verse four. And, and this is this affirmation of worship. It's, it's as if we're saying, yes, he, God is worthy of all praise. It's this reminder that there's something that happens when we sing. We don't just regurgitate a song. We, we don't just try to, to make something that sounds beautiful. I mean, Spotify has us all beat and, and producing music that sounds beautiful. So what are we doing when we sing? Our worship is an amen of itself. It is an affirmation that yes, God, you alone are worthy of my praise. Salvation and glory and power belong to God. And here we see salvation is knowing God and responding in the only way that's right to his power and glory. That it's responding to who God is and what he's done. And yet it's also building. This amen, this praise of God is building to what I think is perhaps the, the greatest image that we have in this chapter, perhaps even the greatest image that we have in all of the Bible. And that comes through the last hallelujah. Verse six, it says, hallelujah, the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. And so this is uh, another way to put this is praise God for he is in absolute control. There is no one who rivals him. No one is greater than him. No, nothing sneaks up on him. There are no accidents with this God. He is almighty. He is in absolute control. But there's a word in there that I think gets to this beautiful image that's given to us. Just a little word that's easy to pass over and yet makes all the difference in the world. The Lord, our God. That he's not some distant entity. He's not some, some power or force that we tap into. No, this is a God who is knowable. That he is approachable. I mean, yes, he is, he is uh, so different from us, but he is ours. He's incomprehensible, but ours. He's uncontainable, but ours. He's uncoercible, but ours. This is the God of the universe, but ours. And the reason why we can make that claim is because God has made us his. That he has and will remove any barrier between us and him. We talked about how Revelation 19 is, is one of the greatest pictures that we have of Jesus and, and we rush through all of those details and descriptions that are given to him and we can spend our lifetime just trying to understand one of those and not scratch the surface and yet in the midst of this chapter that is so full of beauty, there's an image that comes through quite clear and that comes in verse nine. It says, and the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Blessed are those who are invited to this marriage supper of the Lamb. That this closeness to God, the, the ability to call him our God, it, the greatest way that there is to picture this is through a meal. Being invited to God's table, to be so close to him, it's like having a meal with him. And this is something that's been talked about all throughout the Bible. I think of Isaiah 25, that mentions it. Matthew in particular really likes this image, does it in chapters 22, 25, and 26. I mean, think about it. Meals are not for enemies. How, how much do you want to invite someone that you can't stand or you hate into your house to have a meal? 
How much do you want to cook for someone who you can't trust, that doesn't have your best interest in mind? How much do you want to, to spend this time with someone who shows that they aren't worthy to have this time spent with them? I mean, say what you will about it. Some meetings are just better on Zoom. And yet this is the image that's given to us. Meals are such a special, intimate time. It reflects closeness. It says uh, it's set up for people that we care about, those that we want to know, or it's, or it's a reflection of the fact that we know them so well that we want to have a meal with them. And having a meal with someone that says, I want you to be here with me. I want you to be where I'm at, in a place that's meant for my safety and comfort and security, having something that's so special. I I want you to be part of that with no expectation, no obligation placed on you. Be here with me. And that's what God says to his people. Be where I am at. You are invited. Come to this marriage supper. Be where I am at to know and be known by me. This is what God says to his people. And yet how beautiful that image is. It actually goes further than that. Look back at verse seven. It says, let us rejoice and exalt and give, uh, give him the glory. For the marriage of the lamb, Jesus, has come. And his bride, the church, has made herself ready. And it was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saint. Do you you see what's being said here? That our place at this marriage supper, us being invited to this meal, which is a a picture of intimacy with God, to to being so close with him that though he's the God of the universe, we can call him ours. Though though he's so different than us, he has made himself known and, and we are known by him in a close way like this. This image that's given to us of our intimacy with God, we aren't there as mere guests we, we didn't stumble upon it. We're not invited as a plus one. We are brought to this marriage supper as the bride. That is the relationship that God has called us into. That while we have gone astray, every single person on the planet has turned away from this God, he remained ever faithful. That we are tempted by this Babylon, by this prostitute, he has remained faithful and called us his bride. That his intimacy with us is not as distant strangers who have now been brought near, but as a spouse has for a spouse. That is the picture that's given to us of God's love for his people. Not as guests, but as the bride. And it's easy to think in this picture as we're so focused on the grace of God. God has made himself known. All barriers broke down. It's easy to go through, okay, so what do I got to do? I mean, I mean the, the passage itself says that the bride has made herself ready. So, so what do I got to do? How do I, how do I prepare for this wedding day? And, and it's easy to think that. After all, whole industries have been started to try to prepare brides to be ready for their wedding day. So, so what do I got to do? And yes, there's a ton in this passage that points to we are called to remain faithful, that the, we are clothed in uh, the righteous deeds, that we live according to how God has called us to. What we do with our lives now matters. A revelation is written so that we live for God now. It is by seeing what God has done, what he will do, ought to shape our lives now. We live for him now. But do not miss the entire thrust of this chapter. Hallelujah. Praise God who has done it all. Praise the God who has all salvation and glory and power. Praise the God who's brought justice to this world, who's made all things right. Praise the only one worthy of our worship. Praise the God who's, who's granted it to us to clothe ourselves in righteousness, who has made it possible for us to be ready on this day. Praise the God who loves us and cherishes us like a spouse. Our job is to accept the invitation. It makes me think of one of my favorite poems by George Herbert. It's called Love Three. And in it, love is is the name that he uses for God. And so he says, love, which is God, love bade me welcome, yet my soul drew back, guilty of dust and sin. But quick-eyed love, observing me grow slack from my first entrance in, drew nearer to me, sweetly questioning if I lacked anything. A guest, I answered, worthy to be here. And love said, you shall be he. I, the unkind, the ungrateful. Oh, my dear, I cannot look at thee. 
And love took my hand, smiling did reply, who made the eyes but I? Truth, Lord, but I've marred them. Let my shame go where it doth deserve. And know you not, says love, who bore the blame? My dear, then I will serve. You must sit down, says love, and taste my meat. And so I did sit and eat. I mean, that's the invitation. Sit and eat. As the guest of honor, the one specially selected by this God who's so worthy of praise, so worthy of every hallelujah, you are invited. Not as a guest, not accidentally stumbling upon it. You are coming as the bride. Find the salvation that is only found in God, the only one who has power and glory, the only God who has done it all. And that, that is definitely worthy of hallelujah.